TV. This evening's show is coming from Dunham's Bar in Ballinagree. Um, the bar is called the Ploughman Bar and there's a good reason behind that too, which we'll go into later on. Um, tonight we have a host of guests lined up for you and if we get through them all in the night it'll be a miracle. But um, we'll try and balance it out with some song, some stories and some music. So to get the ball rolling we'll belt away with Kjoltis. They're mad to go here behind me.
Well, Balnagree is known as the home of the bowlers, and around me here tonight we've got bowlers of the past and bowlers of the present. Uh, to my left here I have Johnny McCarthy from Carrigola, uh, Gerard Donovan from Balnagree, uh, John Looney, and Dan Quill. So um, I suppose the veteran of the team here tonight is John Looney, and a uh, very good bowler in his day as well. And uh, I think I'll start off by saying a few words to John. Uh, when did the whole thing start for you, John? When did you get interested in bowling? Uh, well, when he was going to school, he played with a small ball, 26-ounce ball, uh, 16-ounce ball rather. And then as I got stronger, the ball got heavier, and I, until I played with a man's ball eventually, a 28-ounce ball. And um, I suppose those times when you started playing, John, the road conditions weren't as good as the present day, were they? Well, they were different altogether. They were all sheets of stones and everything like that. And the only thing about it is that there was no scores played in the winter time. Uh, in them roads because you couldn't, you know. And I suppose the surface of the road had a lot to do with the style of play as well, John, did it? No, it had. You, um, a player that him should have uh, a big loft, you know, and just in, in order to be able to cover the sheets of stones or if you didn't, you know, you'd only get a very sharp throw often, you know. So lofting was a, a key part of the play? Because a key part of it. And, um, We'd say, when did you first go into competition? When was your first tournament, we'd say? Well, my first tournament was Ryland in 1933. Um, uh, I think it was, the, the tournaments were very scarce, you know, there, there were no tournaments that came to They were all challenge scores, and the score they were paired with a challenge score. But this Ryland tournament started in 1933 anyway, and um, uh, I won it. And um, one I've heard a lot about there is a, a cup which you won in, in Bearings. I'm sure there was a very good score involved there, numerous scores involved, but uh, I think we've got the cup here in front of us tonight as well, in pretty good condition and all that. So, have you any memories from this particular score? Well, there was three years afterwards, there was 1936, and uh, it held going on for a year and a half. The final was eventually played in April 1937. And I, won it anyway. They uh, led into April, let's say, in 1937. And who was the man you were competing with on, on that day of the final? John Carter Clareau. And John was a pretty good bowler by all accounts as well, is that right? He was good enough for me anyway, I'd say, and I beat him again in the challenge score afterwards. Uh, one thing I'm hearing about a lot, a lot as well is the rivalry between bowlers over the years. And uh, there's one man that springs to mind there, a uh, local man as well from Rasheen, a man by the name of Sonny Callahan. Do you remember any scores between yourself and Sonny? No, I had two scores with Sonny. We had a score each. And I believe there was fair, was there a friendly rivalry anyway between supporters and that? Well, yes, a little bit of rivalry, friendly as was, you know. Uh, very good. Um, who used to stand road for you that time, John, is it a fair to ask her? Uh, well, uh, in all war players, you were uh, himself, uh, Mick Carr, Kerry Geller, Bill Sather and Jim Sather. And, and uh, by all accounts, Mick had some very encouraging words for you. He had some, we'd say, a bit of advice to you before every score. Oh, he said he was a very bad starter anyway. <laughs> <laughs> he also had some motto to, to, as to all the tactics you would, you would adopt, we'd say, to what your, what your uh, approach would be to the to the your opposite number would say? Oh, you can it. Mm -hmm. And to uh, something about breaking his spirit, I heard somewhere along the way. The toughness, well, then see the road. Often before I throw the ball, it's hard to break down a man's courage to delay him. But uh, of course, you could break down a man's courage too in two ways, probably by beating him to the start. But uh, you said to me, you don't know that uh, you know it meant an awful lot if I would get away from a man at the beginning. You know. That uh, it would break his heart, you know, uh, when they'd be odds with him. But I couldn't do that at all because they were very bad at that, so it was no good for him to be telling me that. <laughs> You're also president of uh, the North Cork region of Bowl Common, John, is that right? Yes, that's right. And uh, you were involved in the setting up of the Common there in 1961, is that right? Yes, I was the, the first meeting, the first, uh, I was actually president the first night 
uh, of meeting in Kilkorni. And I'm still present. So I say, well, I want to do it in what way. <laughs> Very good. Um, I'll go to the left of me here now, and uh, the man who's had great success there during the year is a man by the name of George Donovan, who's actually the son of the publican, Lena May. And um, George has won uh, the North Cork. He's a fine copy of in front of us tonight, uh, which he won in... Where did you win it, George, actually? Uh, Dunamore. And uh, you've actually won the A and the B, is that right? The trophy in front represents the... Uh, that was uh, for the B, and um, the big cup there on the right was for the beating of the Amen to win the monster. And who was your opponent there in, in the final? Can you remember? Of the B or the A? Uh, of both. <laughs> well, my opponent in the B was... Um, he was John Linehan from Bally Shonen, about the same age as myself, so we were fairly even. Very good. And then the other? Uh, well, the man that was much stronger than me, he was Paddy Ronan from Overlook. Yeah, I know Paddy fairly well, actually. Um, but uh, how do you, do you tend to keep at the bowling, or? I hope so. Very good. Uh, another man here who t who is very good on the ball playing is Johnny McCarthy from Carrigola. Uh, Johnny... <laughs> Johnny uh, won a uh, cup there on his day as well, and uh, this is the cup here, I think there's one in, in Rasheen, is that right, Johnny? That's right, yeah. And wh when would that have been, what date? No, uh, no, open junior. And it was in, uh, I think there's on the cup here, actually, uh, 1956. That's right, yeah. And who was your opponent on the day, Johnny, can you remember? Johnny Leary, drum dog. Johnny Leary, yeah, I know Johnny as well. And, um... I've heard as well that you had a run in there with an All Ireland winning man as well by the name of Johnny Creedon from Clonjohad, is that right? That's right. And uh, I think he came out the worst of you on the day, would that be right? It did, yeah. <laughs> so uh, anything can happen, this wasn't bowling and you, 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 were, you were on fire that day, not out? I was the fire that evening, all right. <laughs> also here to the right of me is Dan Quill from Carrigola. Dan as well uh, has won the North Cork, like Gerard. And uh, when, when did you win the North Cork then? 68. I beat Mick Murphy in the final. Where was uh, Mick Murphy from? Dunamore. Dunamore men again there. And uh, the Dance Cup isn't actually here tonight, but uh, no doubt. Uh, he has pulled off the win anyway, that's the main thing. And we've had two North Cork winners anyway from the local area, which is pretty good. Um, John Looney, uh, would you have any advice now for the likes of Gerard? We'd say starting off, uh, what would be his best approach towards his career? And, how would he go about it in the best way, do you think? Well, uh, I think he's going about it uh, as it is, it is, but uh, the only advice I would give him, uh, I, I didn't see them play much, uh, to be tough and um, be said by his uh, road chores, and uh, there's no harm to get beaten a few times, you know, in your youth. You know, it toughens you. You, know. you can't win always score, and if you do in the beginning, if you win always score in the beginning, you can't uh, put up with losing one, then, you know, you'd, you'd break your heart, kind of. Uh, there was one man that I've heard a lot about as well, as a man who won the All-Ireland, a man by the name of Tim Delaney from Fairhill in Cork. I've heard that yourself and himself had a little lofting competition there in Rayleigh, and once upon a time, is that right? Yes, that's right, too. And um, on the day, how did things go? Well, he beat me in the last throw, I think, but uh, I heard after that he, he beat me with a little ball. He actually reduced the weight of the 28, 28 is it? Yeah. Of course, I couldn't be sure of that, you know, but that, I, I thought I had it from good authority. And it was uh, many years after, was it? Oh, many years after I heard about it, yes. Very good. Um, also, good ballers of that era, have you any more memories of good ballers from that time? Do you remember any names that spring to mind that were pretty good in your book? Well, that I do. I saw some very good book I saw the very best of the seniors, I suppose. I saw old Bennett and um, Dele uh, Tim Delaney, we have mentioned already. Um, Mick Barry, of course, who was, I suppose, the outstanding man of all, maybe. And then there was Rich Crowley from Bandon, there was uh, Yaman Cattle of Fatten. I uh, many like that. <laughs> and uh, when you started off your career, you said, uh, would you think that you picked up hints from a lot of the, let's say, the older bowlers at the time? Did you watch their style or that interest you at all? I, I did, and uh, well, I tried to learn a good style if I could. You know, I made out that was 
one of the essential things, you know, to learn to have a good method of doing the job. Uh, in this into your career there, John, I heard that you laid off for a while. There was a few years there that you gave up bowling completely and came back, sort of by accident. Would that be true? <laughs> well, that is true to us, but in, in a way it is, I suppose. And how did you get back into it again with say, after laying off for a while? Uh, how did it come about? Uh, I gave up anyway because there were little roles roles stuff years ago, and uh, I didn't believe in that kind of job. So I thought that it was time for me anyway to call it a day. I had a good few scores, one, and I said, call it a day. But anyway. Uh, if no one persevered in me to, to, to start again and to play himself a score. You know, which in other table age made it an unfortunate and that started me off again. And this got you back into the stride of the back again. Yeah. Very good. And um you kept playing for good years after that, John good many years after that, did you John? Yeah, I did. Kept playing a good few years after that again. But I'd be just as thankful to myself if we didn't. <laughs> so uh, you'd like to see the local interest keep you up in the bowling, no doubt, and uh, people like Gerard and maybe a lot more entering it, would you? Pen? Yeah. People like Gerard, you'd like to see a lot more like him going into the sport, maybe, and trying to win tournaments and that sort of thing? And, uh, you know, I'm delighted to see a good man starting up again from Van a good uh, young man, uh, Johnny McCarthy knows. You know, it's the best of the day and Dan Quill. Uh, Maybe you wouldn't play much more. It is nice to see uh, a new man starting up and uh, showing good. Uh, well, to all appearances, the, the, that he is the makings of a good man. Um, the stakes are slightly higher now as well, John, than when you started. Have you any idea what the amount of the stake would be when you started first, let's say, on the bowling? I have. And they were very small because money was very scarce. Uh, at that time, five or ten pounds, you know, was a, you know, was a fair, fair stake for a nice score, you know, and the score was about three miles in, and uh, five pounds, ten pounds, then after a bit when people got more money, it was twenty pounds, and uh, eventually around the 1940s it went to fifty pounds. And at the moment the course stakes would be much over that hope. So between the eight ounce bowl, uh, when I saw it first, it was uh, only four old pennies. Four pennies hit me. That was the place of the 28 ounce bowl day. Very good. And um, we'll say uh, at the moment, how the stakes, how would the average stake be roughly at the moment on the score? Have you any idea? Is there any normal figure? It's an easy up to a thousand pounds now. <coughs> Big change over the years, John, isn't it? <laughs> um, there's a change in the way. Uh, money isn't as valuable as it has been. But the interest is still in the bowling anyway, in Bell and Green, by all accounts, it's still the home of the bowlers, so we hope it continues into the future. We hope it will continue. Uh, it seems a fair anyway to say that this nice young man starting up here now and, uh, after winning a big trophy. Very good. Uh, Johnny, Gerard, John and Dan, thank you very much. Now our next guest is a man called Bertie Neal. He's a local man and he's singing for you a local song. It's called The Mama Valley. So Bertie, take it away. <laughs> the hills are clad with purple and the sky like warbles high. And many's a fine September morn When our clothes are cast the sky <coughs> Down from Mama Valley Comes the cool and gentle breeze 
and won't you wander there with me to pick the blackberries? There is a healthy hillside where the hare lives long and free, where mushroom or in lofty pride looks down on the away. Drowsy nooks by shady brooks, the home of wandering bees, will soothe our ears with music while we pick the blackberries. The young men all with joyous hearts have stepped unto the fair. The lassies gay and bright as they have gone to meet them there. But Mary dear, we do not care for either those or thee. While hand in hand we'll stroll along and pick the blackberries. <coughs> The gentle river Lawn flows at the foot of Balnagri, and many a briery glen it knows from Shran to the Lee. In some retreat where flowers still grow, we'll nestle at our ears. And we'll talk of love, my darling, while we pick the blackberries. When we speak of athletes from the past, I suppose one that comes to mind, I suppose the greatest man around was uh, the late Paddy Keefe. Uh, we're very fortunate tonight to have Paddy's son, Danjo, here to the left of me, and uh, Paddy's uh, nephew, nephew uh, Michael, to the right. We've also his two granddaughters here as well, and um, as we all know, Paddy was the first man to bring an All-Ireland title to Balnagree with his run in the uh, mile. Uh, Paddy also uh, ran in America and trained there with the Irish team for three, for three months. Um, Dan Joe, I suppose, uh, his very first uh, run, uh, very first win, where was it at all? Well, he started off, I think, in Ballinagree, the first in the sports. Like, and uh, he, was, he was 18 at the time, I think he was late starting. And then he went on from that to Ned and won in Ned. I've heard a very good story about the day he went to Ned. He didn't get any, we'll say, uh, bus to Ned anyway, for one. Oh, he, was, he, he thought it easier to walk across the hill, which was five miles, than to, to cycle around the road. So, his first was a bit of exercise to <laughs> soften out the bones. <coughs> I'd say it would all right. And I suppose after winning, he walked back home again. Yeah, yeah, there was no other choice, I'd say, at that time, when he footed back. But so he, had, he had a good clock coming back, an eight-day clock, which is still going perfect. That was his prize for the day. Yeah, which was nice at the time. Matt. Perfect. Still going perfect in the other club. Um, he, he had a good lot of monster wins as well, is that right? And we've got a medal here in front of me, actually, which he won in um, 19, uh, 1909. Uh, where was this held, I wonder, uh, Danger? I, don't, I wouldn't be sure, no. Just yeah. Cross country. country. Yeah. So, 1909. Um, then he, he went on to, uh, to win in All-Ireland, and uh, when, when was that at all? It was in late 1909 again, four mile, it was a four-mile huddle race, he won that. So he, he wasn't strictly confined to the, to the mile run at all? No, no, he, he was more of a long distance run, better at long distance, longer the better. And I'm told that it wasn't with the amount of training that he used to get to the top at all, really, is that right? No, well, not really, it's a very little training. He had to cycle the cock the day he went um, for the train to Dublin. 
cycling, which was 24 miles, and get into Dublin. And he was handicapped in Dublin because he was mis like he was 19. There were 19 laps back in him. Being Cork was the 19 county, so he, he had a great friend in Cork. Told me he was always uh, Nedley to the Paddy Mickey told me all Mike uh, Mike I think yeah, and just. He was encouraging man, so he, they were all delighted when he brought it back for Cork and there. So um, when he went on to run later on for the Irish team, uh, they went to America, but things didn't go according to plan. Is that right, Danjo? Yeah. I uh, they went training to America for the, to be something similar to the Olympics now, but it, that, that was in Boston. But someone that wanted to run in East Cambridge and the race never came off. But he was training there for three months, which was a great experience anyway, sure. That's true. <laughs> uh, Paddy did come off, of course, not at all. Um, Michael, you have a few memories of uh, Paddy as well. Uh, have you anything that springs to mind there from the word go? Well, yes, I have, and from a lot of local people, as there's people here tonight, could tell you the same story. John Looney, the one man here, I'd say. They could tell you, he ran in McCroom, he won his race. There were so many competitors there, and uh, he was thrown out of the race that was to represent... Uh, to represent Ireland and Michael Toomey was representative also in the club and he insisted that he won his race and that he was entitled to run and um, they had to bring him back in again and when he was running for the All-Ireland um, I was only very young when I heard this first um, he went in Michael Toomey went into him he was actually his trainer and he says to him, um, Paddy, don't leave us down today. He said, I'll die. He said, I'll win this race. And won it, he did. And after winning it, when he came into the hotel, the um, governor said, where does he come from then? They said, a place called Musher. Oh, the Moonlighter, he says. <laughs> <laughs> and the uncle said, Moonlighter or no Moonlighter? He said, I have something. He said, to show he said, to you. <laughs> I went all Ireland win. But he ran many races, and his last race was down in um, the county Limerick, and he was handicapped two rounds the field, which was really out of question altogether. So he didn't want to run, and um, another uncle insisted that he would run. So he did run, and he won that last race also. And he got the spikes a few times running, and Ned, but he still came out victorious. And he was a man that went through a lot of torture in his time, through the troubled times here in Ireland. He they ran him bare for it through furs. He still came out. He was a mystery man, really, because he could be really tired, as tired as could be, and yet give him one half hour and he'd be back again, as fresh as ever. Is that right, John? <laughs> um, very good, uh, Michael. Um, is there some other story, no doubt, that, you'd, that might spring to mind as well there now as we're talking about hard times and that sort of thing and trying to train rough conditions? Well, uh, yes, times were very, very hard at the time. Everybody was in the same footing as it was, in the same level. But um, he had a special diet. I remember the other saying that he, there was a special cake and he had, uh, there had different food at that time. They had better food, really, at that time, right? But he really lived it up and he had the best of, you know, athletes food at the time as far as, you know, and um, he, when he went out to run, he really meant to, to go out to win, like he didn't go out to just run along with the pack, he went out to win, he won some very, very hard races. And of course, being the first All Ireland to Belgrade, I suppose there was fierce local interest at the time. I suppose it was an amazement in itself, was it? Well, I heard the old people saying when I said the old people, the words before me. I suppose I heard them saying that was the greatest, you know, thing that ever happened in Belgrade. That there were celebrations and bonfires for days and days, and just something did come to my mind there when he was running in uh, Cork um, Sports. Michael Toomey came out to him about. Um, about 10 o'clock in the morning, he cycled out, and uh, the uncle was after cutting a meadow of hay at the time with his scythe. And uh, the grandfather said, no way, he said, he's not going, he said, because he's up, he said, since 4 o'clock this morning, he said, cutting hay, he said, and there's no way he's going to cycle into Cork and run again. So 
Well, he told me he got the better of money and he took him in and he put him lying on a sofa. He gave him tea and biscuits and he went out and he won two races. Some good tea and biscuits, I'd say, Michael, what a sound of them. <laughs> Um, as well as that, I suppose with the, uh, there's a new club after starting up Naheen at the moment, a new athletic club, and I suppose by bringing uh, about again, we say talking about people like like um, Paddy and so on, we might get local interest involved again in the club, and hopefully people will try to make for maybe say an All Ireland again or the Olympics or something. It might be a bit of incentive too. Would you think so? Oh, definitely yes. I mean, it's up to the people to bring them out because I mean. People are a lot happier today if you can bring them out and do something. There's very, very few people interested today in sports and there's nothing next. I mean, they're more interested in drinking or something else today, like, which is, you know, if there's time for drink too, but maybe there's more time for sports if they really want to put their minds to it and they could be a lot happier today. There's plenty of sports available today for people if they really took play part. Um, I noticed here, then, or, uh, Michael, we've got a pretty nice picture as well of the late Paddy Keith, a large picture there, then you can you pick it up? Um, I think it captures the mood of the day. As far as I know, this was taken on the day he won the All-Ireland. Would that be right, Danjo? Right, yeah. Yeah. In Dublin. In Dublin, is it? Yeah, that's right, yeah. So I think this captures the actual mood of the day and the determination in his face, I said, speak for it, speaks for itself and uh, the dress of the time as well. Very interesting, and um, I mean, he looks pretty fit, you have to admit. Um, as well as that, here now we've got um, his granddaughters. Um, this is Daniel's daughter here to the right of me. Uh, what's your name? Siobhan. Siobhan. And to the left of me here, we've got another one of his granddaughters, and your name is? Sheila Murray. And Sheila has a message here, I think, for her granny, is that right? Yes. Uh, will you give it to her so. Uh, I'd like to say hello to my granny, Murray, who lives in Cain Mill Street, and also Nora and David, and my teachers and my cousins in Cardigan School. Very good. And I suppose maybe two athletes of the future here as well, alongside me. We hope for the best. Uh, Michael, Dancho, and the two girls, thanks very much. Um, as we're on the subject of athletics, I suppose it's very well worthwhile mentioning another man who's had some great success there recently. In fact, he's from the same townland as the late Paddy Keefe. Uh, he's a lad called uh, John Horgan. He's 13 years of age and recently he's won an All-Ireland individual medal there in the De La Salle Colleges. Uh, he's also, uh, we also here tonight have his uh, um, team medal as well, which is a silver medal. Uh, John wasn't able to come to us tonight, but He's been very good in sending along the medals. Um, he's also, his brother Connie also has great success in the 100 metres. And Connie has won the Munster title on numerous occasions. I think five in all. And he's also been very successful in cross country. And um, Connie's father, John, as well, uh, has been involved in bowling in a big way. And also uh, he, he ran and boxed in, in the States as well. So uh, it's very nice to see a young man heading off in the same line as Paddy Keefe and we wish him all success in the future. <laughs> Our next guest is a man who originally came from Kilimartra and is now living in Molnahorna. A very good singer he is too, so put your hands together for Paddy Cronin. I'm a God-fearing woman, I dwell with me husband, to Jake and to lovely Raquel. I got so many children, I live like the sheep, who fed for twelve months on his tail. 
Tis childer and childer and then many more With black eyes and blue eyes and brown Sleeping in scores with their head through the doors And they're all worth so lovely half crown For they're in through the windows and out through the doors And there's more from the roof hanging down when the story is told, they're as precious as gold, and they're all worth a lovely half crown. There's Minnie and Molly, Paddy and Tom, Mickey and Teddy and Joe. There's Richie and Donald, Nora and Kate, Robert and Danny and Flo. There's more of them too. But their names I forget, I can count them by night lying down. They're precious, I'm told, they're as precious as gold, and they're all worth a lovely half crown. For they're in through the windows and out through the doors, and there's more from the roof hanging down. When the story is told, they're as precious as gold, and they're all worth so lovely half crown. There's my own sister Bid, a respectable girl, herself and her man they have too. They're tearing their hair, and they're scolding like mad, for poor Bid won't have more than the two. While meself and me man are the cock of the walk, I have a silver fox for hanging down. The schoolmaster greets me, wherever he meets me, he twinkles and says half a crown. For they're in through the windows and out through the doors, and there's more from the roof hanging down. When the story is told, they're as precious as gold, and they're all worth a lovely half crown. To the post office with me, the lady inside had a smile on her face when she spoke. But the last time I asked for a two-penny stamp, tis with pride sure I thought that she'd choke. The telegram by drew wide open the door, and his face there was never a frown. Sweet madam, good day, then to me he did say, call back for your sack of half crowns. For I ran through the windows and out through the doors, and there's more from the roof hanging down. When the story is told, they're as precious as gold, and they're all worth a lovely half crown. To the post. A proper slum og, I confess that I was, till this wonderful act of in view. But there's nothing far more I resembled on earth than the woman who lived in a shoe. And that now the same shoe and a different foot, I have jewels and lace hanging down. No wonder I'm gay and my journey today, for I'm going for my sack of half crowns. For they're in through the windows and out through the doors, and there's more from the roof hanging down. When the story is told, they're as precious as gold, and they're all worth a lovely half crown. Now, if this goes much further, I'd swear on me oat that love making won't be any more. For when Maggie goes courting with Paul Paddy Joe, it won't be the same as before. For she'll never get a kiss 
nor the ghost of a hug, nor even a while sitting down. No more moonlight and roses and musk on their noses. They live on the sweet half a crown. For they're in through the windows and out through the doors. And there's more from the roof hanging down. The story is told. They're as precious as gold. And they're all worth a lovely half crown. So spinsters and bachelors, come listen to me. For I'm an experienced dame. Get married, get married, I'll tell you today. For marriage is all that they claim. For God feed the birds with the haws of the trees. So away with the grimmick and frown. The fall fruit should fail at the end of me tail. I live on the sweet half a crown. For I in through the windows and out through the doors. And there's more from the roof hanging down. When the story is told, they're as precious as gold. And they're all worth a lovely half crown. Six brilliant, brilliant dancers there were uh, Kay Coakley, Catherine O'Donoghue, Juliet Healy, Cora O'Mahony, Margaret Cotter, and Annette Driscoll. I think they were brilliant, so I deserve another round of applause. <laughs> well, next to me here, I've got a man called Moya Connell, well known in the area for his violin playing. And uh, Moya, just a few words before you start the tune for us. Uh, when did the violin playing start with you? When did you take it up? Oh, when I was about 12 years of age. And uh, did you learn it from any of your parents or just picked it up on your own? It was in the family always. And the people before me played music and it passed down that way. Your father was uh, a great man on the violin, I believe, as well. Oh, he was. Always in the violin. He was, yes. My father my father play always and we played in after him, you know. To come to you that way. Yeah. So you'd watch his finger movements and so on on the bridge and try to... That's right. Watch him play and maybe sometime, you know, they get two violins playing together and if we make a mistake, he tell you. Very good. So, uh, Maya, you'll play a few tunes for us, no doubt. What will you start with there now? I'll start with little polka. Okay? Very good. So, you hand for Maya Connell.
Very good, Maya. Very good. Big hand for Maya Connell. Thank you, Maya. Well, our next guest is no other than Peggy Lynch, or Peg Benny Lynch, because she's known on the competition circuit. Uh, Peggy has great success there over the years in traditional singing, not to mention novelty acts and uh, numerous other uh, parts of Kyoltis as well. So, Peggy, um, when did it all start for you at all? Well, I've been singing all my life. I suppose the call to start about six years ago. And that's when I, well, I entered competitions then. Um, I heard earlier on there you entered a competition when you were about 13 years of age. Is that right? That's right, yeah, here in Belnagree. In Belnagree? Mm-hmm. Um, Travelling, road tour, they were putting on plays. And uh, they had a competition for talent, and I won it. And, of course, the prize money was very high, I believe, as well. <laughs> Two pounds. <laughs> Outstanding altogether, but still no, it's, it was good at the time anyway. It was, yeah. Uh, since then you've got on and won the All-Ireland in 84 uh, in Innes, is that right? That's right, yeah. Um, Colin Gehrig is the name of the competition, and um, in May in Innes I won it. And as well as that, you've entered another competition there which you pulled off the All-Ireland as well. It was uh, to do with uh, unrecorded songs, is that right? Um, that was in... 82, I think. It was for a selection of ballads, and uh, I sang all local ballads from the parish of Heenley. And where was this held then, Peggy? Kilorglin. Kilorglin as well. And uh, you've been involved in a little bit of acting over the time as well, I believe, in novelty acts, is that right? Yeah, we... I've been involved in a few novelty acts with Neely Coakley. Very good. And all your songs, I'm told, have to do with local, local locations and local people, is that right? Well, the majority of them, yes. I like to get as many of the local songs as I can and learn them, you know, because they'll get lost if somebody don't write them down. And your biggest source of songs would be, we'd say, pick them up directly from people, or is it old books, or where do you get them along the way, or would you like to give away the secret at this stage? Well, Daily Coakley, I think, is my main source uh, for songs, you know. I get an awful lot of my songs from him. Yeah, hopefully we might get one from him too later on. <laughs> but anyway, Peggy, before we go any further, I suppose, uh, we'll have to ask you to give a song, so what would you sing for us tonight? Well, it's not a local song, it's called Griffinstone Hill. Griffinstone Hill. So a big hand for Peggy Lynch and Griffinstone Hill. <laughs> the battle, it was over, out in Griffinstone. 
stone hill and the great cry of a victory was heard loud and shrill the soldiers they were routed and the rebels pursued as far as the green fields and the woods of Kuru by a sycamore tree on a pine covered hill a young Irish rebel lay bleeding there still. The pale moon, it was shining brightly down from the sky. And it cast its fair rays where Oh, young hero did lie. Then slowly he lifted his uncovered head and to his loyal comrades around him he said, My life is Fast ending, sure it can't be long more. When all earthly troubles for me will be o'er, take this note to my father who lies. In his bed, and tell him that the son of his bosom is dead. Tell to Kathleen O'Donovan my affectionate wife that I love. I have loved her in life. Tell to Erin, my country, that patriotic isle, that for her I have lived and for her I'll now die. Like the rebel who was shot out on Griffin's town hill. Well, here in front of me we've got the Coakleys. We've got two sisters and a brother and sister, they're actually cousins. So they'll play a few tunes for us. So a big hand together for the core, please.
Well, here beside me we have a man called Jack Cotter from Horsemount, and he's a very good song here called Living in London. So, Jack, away with you. I wish I'd get employment in the land where I was born. Oh, for I am always dreaming of my own dear native home. I can see the river in e as it flows close to Tishini. And the old grove, it grows out as it reaches every shore. I am living now in London, but my mind is always yearning. For the day I'll be returning to dear old ends I the village of my childhood is I can see through smoke the fog and hills And the grassy banks where I did live In dear old Enamore And the bar roads where I rambled and the crossroads where I gambled As we pitched and tossed the pennies near McFlanagan's old ford I am living now in London But my mind is always yearning for the day I'll be returning to dear old Erns Isle. Oh, for I am not a scholar, those lines I'm sure you'll follow. For a college education, I never could receive for poverty and hunger was there when I was younger. Oh, but praise the Lord, those days are gone away forevermore. I am living now in London. But my mind is always yearning For the day I'll be returning To dear old Ernst Isle uh, This time we have Maureen Looney and Mary Harley to do a hornpipe for you So come on ladies and bang the floor there for us
Our next guest is a man called Jerry O'Connor, or better known locally as Jerry Nealis. Uh, Jerry has a few very good stories and some very old stories, and has a fantastic memory for dates as well. So, um, Jerry tells one very good story there about the location of uh, Balnagree Church at the moment. There seems to be a big story behind its location and how it came at all to be in the village of Balnagree. So, Jerry, how did it all start? Well, um Hargens de Omen, they lived in Carrigiola for uh, Denmark, Denmark Sloan, only is, and uh, they, were, they had uh, a, a lot to do in the building of the uh, Bernabri Chapel. Well, uh, it was built in two different uh, parts, or two different times. Before that, the first uh, chapel was below at Captain Barn, it was tight. And uh, the, par- the priest of the parish wanted it to, uh, to get it built in the same place. But uh, the omen, they objected. They wanted to get it built uh, in Carrigal in their own uh, land. And a dispute rose between uh, the priest and, uh, and, and, and the omen. And uh, the, the dispute was settled by what uh, Argon the omen would walk in 10 minutes from a uh, couple in Barn Cross. So uh, the, uh, the priest followed him on horseback and he walked to where the, 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 the chapel door stands in 10 minutes. And uh, the, the first part then it was going from east to west. Later on then uh, they, they broke the wall in the southern part and they built a long chapel off it. So, um, uh, that was uh, it was they were responsible for it. they were builders as well as uh, yeomen and uh, they were they were contractors we'll say um as you mentioned yeomen there jerry uh myself anyway is one uh, what was actually the the um one thing i don't understand is what was the, the purpose of the yeoman at the time well uh, they were acting uh, as a uh, police uh, in the during that was the time of the british rule here in this country and there was no, uh, there was no police barracks, but the omen were acting as police, and uh, if we were travelling the road at him, Carrigiola, you should uh, report to where they were going, or you could be arrested. We should give an account for would be going at him, and uh, they, they were very strict. And uh, they were, uh, I remember a story told by uh, the old people. Um, there was a. This uh, the, this fellow he he was a robber. He was uh, known as um, Simon Brown, the Busher Mountain Highway robber. <coughs> <laughs> and he dwelt in a cave, a hidden cave in Busher. And he had another cave uh, in in Douglas Mountain in the uh, other side, for he had a great view of the Conopog Road. <laughs> but um, uh, at that time. At that time, there was a lot of carry men as, and cork men as well. They would take their bottle to cork in Turkey instead of bottle merchant. And uh, <coughs> it is these misfortunate people on their way back that the robber was to attack. And um, the omen in Carrigula, they, they, they offered a reward for anyone that would uh, capture or help to capture him. But um, he carried on for a long time. And uh, there were several stories told about him. There was, he was in Cork one time, and he went into the shoemaker's shop where he uh, put on, fitted on a pair of shoes. And he rushed out into the street then. He was followed by the shoemaker with a hammer. And he, the shoemaker started shouting to stop the thief. But he, he uh, kept shouting to clear the way by his, he would say, we're running for a wager. And he escaped into the crowd. <laughs> Another time, really, he was over in uh, Douglas Mountain early in the morning. It was a wet morning. Uh, and uh, he see a white horse 
is a horseman. He really a white horse coming along the Cunabog Road and he rushed to come before him. He rushed across the valley under Ned Caves. And he, the horseman saw him coming and he galloped the animal. But he was, he was so active he caught the animal by the tail but he failed to use his sword. And he held to the tail till he reached the top of Toker. But it, after that he was captured by, uh, there were two Hargan brothers. They lived in the, the farm they saw now by uh, John Murphy, Upper Bernagree. And uh, he, they were up early in the morning, they were preparing to go to a fair, and they heard the woman shouting and crying outside in the road. So uh, they rushed the wood, and there uh, she was, and uh, he was after robbing her of a five pound note. She wrote a five pound note that he was, would be as good as five hundred pounds now. She was after um, travelling all that night with her donkey and car. But the two brothers rushed him. And he he had a gun he fired, but uh, he, he was uh, out to look to say, warning the powder was damp. <laughs> and <coughs> he rushed out the, the, the mountain, followed by the two brothers. And one brother had a better run than the other, and he was well over the hill on the northern side when one of the brothers got up to him, and uh, an apple struggle took place. But he held on to him until the other brother came up, and they took him prisoner. And for whatever reason, anyone don't know, it was out to the Kilcorny yeoman, they took him. And the yeoman in Carrigal was so mad that he evicted them out of their place, or out of his place. But the yeoman in, in, in Kilcorny took them in, and uh, they said that their relatives are st still alive in Kilcorny, living all the time. My God. Um, I tell you, Jerry, uh, there's another story there, uh, which I, I'm sure you know. It's, uh, you have a lot of information there on the Taylor Duggan. By all accounts, he was a, a very good character in the area at the time. And um, is there any story you have there? I'm sure I, I heard somewhere along the way you had a story about some time he went on the spree and uh, something happened to him. Well, uh, there was uh, several stories told about him. Uh, there was one story, I often heard it. You see, there was a barrack below here in Balnagri at the time. And uh, uh, the, the pub here, it was belonged to um, Julie Carroll at that time. And it was a touch pub, and the walls were widening it. And uh, she had a little, a little, we'll say, a, a window or something like that, uh, about a foot square, where she was left out. Uh, gallon of porter or a half gallon. It was, uh, the, the, it was going that him half gallons and gallons of porter. That's the way they was by it. And uh, she was leaving it out to the back after hours because the barrack was below here and she she had to watch her time. So um, this sergeant anyway, he wasn't too bad. And uh, she was often slip out a uh, half gallon of porter to him. But uh, no, it was secret, so no, nobody knew it. But uh, of course, Taylor Duggan knew it. But uh, there was some racket below the river. The sergeant was after a fellow that were fishing, and he got his coat tore. He all ripped down the back of it, and he took it up to the tailor to get it fixed. And um, the tailor said he was busy. No, he said he was making a suit that he he'd, he'd, he'd fix it as soon as he could. So he left it to him. But the tailor went down, and he put the coat on him behind the the pub here, and he put his hand uh, in with the, uh, and uh, when she saw the stripes, you know, the sergeant's stripes in the, in the sleeve, she left out her gallon of porter. <coughs> but uh, the sergeant went up after for that gallon, for, uh, for his coat, but the uh, tailor told him he hadn't done, he gave me another bit of time, mm -hmm. and he held on, and he held on, they said, to the court until he had about Three or four gallons of porter got for nothing. She was sure to the <laughs> Very good. Um, one other story there I've heard you tell Jerry as well is the time that Taylor Duggan went to Cork uh, and he, he decided to get the hair cut or something like that. Oh, yes, he, he, he went to Cork at another time. Here he was talking about a Cork. He had a sister in Cork. She was living in Blackpool. But uh, he was going awful sprees. 
but he, he wasn't as free this time anyway. And when he got up this morning and he looked at himself in the mirror, well, he was terrible annoyed when he see the big mohel of hair he had and uh, he wasn't shaved for about a fortnight. So uh, the first thing he done, he went away and he went to the barber shop and he went into this barber and uh, he gave him a haircut and a, and a, and a, and a shave. But uh, when he looked for the money to pay him, he had nothing. Only he, he only phoned to help me and the, the barber went mad. He talked to help me up with him. And, uh, <coughs> he uh, cleared him out the door, and uh, as he was going out the door, he lifted him with three kicks in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> so things are there. Uh, and uh, so when he landed in Balnagria, when he, when he landed here in Balnagria, the following day, they were all admiring the fine haircut he got, and, 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 and the shave. And they were saying, I suppose the barbers are fairly dear in Cork these times. Well, so see, I got a haircut, a shave, and my ass kicked for a hate me. <laughs> Big hand up for Jolly O'Connor. Well, here beside me is All Ireland Plowing Champion uh, many times, uh, Jolly Horgan. And um, Jolly is well known, I suppose, the link to Brett of, of, of Ireland. So, uh, Jolly, when did the, all the plowing competitions start and how did you get interested in it at all? Give me a shame to think. <laughs> oh, God, can't you give me a shame to think? Didn't that the fellow win in Macron, 1941, the cop below there up? So Johnny, is it? Yes, yeah. I started then after that, and then no more. Yes. So, so uh, I came the first A good start. <laughs> Very good, Oscar. I held that head then, and I'm in the up. So you went on then to win all Ireland's and numerous other plowing matches around the, around the country, Johnny? 26 years plowing per car county. 26? Per car county. Very good. Very good. Mm. That deserves a round of applause, definitely. And I suppose there was many rivals along the way, Jerry. There was a few members of opposition that, you know, there'd be a kind of rivalry between you, would there? Yeah, well, well we wouldn't be that awful jealous at all. Good friends behind it all. <laughs> good, good friends behind it all. Mm. And a friend of yours, uh, friend of yours, Teddy Keller, he's won the world there lately, is that right? I thought he'd be here tonight. I'd be glad if he was. <laughs> We'd be very glad if he was too. Uh, maybe we get a chance. My honor. I opened my old dance and you pressed to my. That's right, you plowed my ass several times. Tony, open my hands. More, more, than, more than once. More than once, several times. You said you'd open a better land than me. <laughs> <laughs> but, um. But, uh, what was I going to say to you? Um. The, the All Ireland, I suppose uh, there was fierce crowd following at that time and a lot of people would travel away to the, to the finals and that sort of thing, would they? A lot of local people would go with you to the, to the competition? No one. No one. No one. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any good in telling you yeah. when we went to the first ploy? Very good. We hadn't too much money. We sold on the water bridge we ran, well, six bob, yes. with the right hundred one there. Oh my God. <laughs> 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 you weren't going to wait at all anyway. Right. <laughs> Six bob. Very good. But um, we we'll say in the competitions that time, it was solo, so the solo effort, so there wasn't too many going with you, it was yourself and uh, a few, a few locals. Only people that I drink like that. Any crowd goes with me. The, don't you know? So that the, <laughs> <laughs> the few jazz below that corner too. There'd be a few jazz. There'd be part after the the plowing match. Of course, there'd be a good crack in the in the bars with there. There'd be a good. Of course, or we are decent and we are out. <laughs> <laughs> we never brought a bob home. Never <laughs> Most of the prize money went to and refreshment we there. That's it and rub. Rub. <laughs> we went for the other stuff. And uh, we said the cops. Have we a cop in the bar there, lads? If we could get it for a minute. What are the cops, maybe? 
But um, I suppose the cups were filled in many occasions, I suppose, along the way? They were. <laughs> and they were filled here inside all Ireland's cups. And I brought the Minister for Agricultural Shield in here twice. Twice? <laughs> yes. I thought he'd kill her about tonight. There he goes. He put it up in 1932, the Agricultural... The Minister for Agriculture put it up in 1932. Put up this cup, is it? No, the shield. Oh, the shield, shield. yeah. Mm. 1932. We just have the cup there for a second and just one look at it. Shut the goddamn way to you, Pastor. Limestone, a box, just dropped by Buckleys. Is that right? Perpetual cup, yeah. This was the cup that was won out, uh, Jerry. Where was this cup won? Bantier. Bantier. And uh, what year would that be, roughly? Uh, some other one. <laughs> <laughs> the dates. The dates are unclear, clear, yeah. But um, in Bantier, anyway. And you travelled miles, I suppose, to a lot of competitions that time? Travelled up where there was a plowing. It was in the 32 counties nearly, you could say, I suppose. Then we got here in place with horses and band here with horses. Mm -hmm. And where were the All-Ireland finals? Where were they normally held? The All-Ireland final was then all. And I'm mighty after 26 years with how can I think about it? <laughs> <laughs> Just have to remember them all, I suppose, Charlie. Just have to remember them all. But I suppose, Jolly, there's nobody inclined to take over, and you're trying staff thing, and the house flying around is there, there's nobody younger in, interested in towing, is there? I wouldn't think here around anyway. Oh. But uh, in other places, is there, have you ever seen any younger competitors doing the house plowing with said? They're coming up again. They're coming up again? Yeah. And you'd see them in an odd place? They're coming up, all right. Very good, it's good to see it. Yeah. I was in Middleton. I heard about that too. <laughs> I heard about that recently as well. I did. I was in Middleton and I got 40 quid in a plaque. Very good. <laughs> that was, um, was that an exhibition or something, Jolly? You dashed me to go. Yeah. And that was only a few weeks back, that's right. <laughs> but, um, it was as good as any win, I suppose. Like, you know. To have better, Teddy plowed a couple of sods too. Teddy went as well. He did. He plowed a couple of sods. Very good. So, uh, Bill Connors plowed a couple of sods, sir. Bill? I see Bill actually on the cock exam now as well, <laughs> two days later, that's right. But so I stopped him. <laughs> Bill being a good man on the plow as well. The Thanks very much, Charlie. Thanks a million for coming along. Well, now we have a very fine solo singer here in Annie Looney from Anaganahy, and she's going to sing a, a song called uh, Mary on the Banks of the Lee. So, Annie, away with you. Oh. When two lovers meet down by the green bower, when two lovers meet down beneath the green tree when Mary my fond Mary declared unto a lover you have stolen my young heart on the banks of the lea I loved her very dearly so true and Sincerely, no one in this white world I love more than she. Every bush, every bower, every tree, every flower reminds me of Mary on the banks of the Lee. Don't stay out late on the moor and my Mary. Don't stay out late on the moor and from me. For little was our notion when we parted o'er the ocean that we were. Forever parted 
on the banks of the lea. I loved her very dearly, so true and sincerely. There is no one in this wide world I love more than she. Every bush, every bower, every tree, every flower reminds me of Mary on the banks of the lea. I will pluck my love some roses, some blooming Irish roses. I will pluck my love some roses, the finest ever grew, and I'll place them on the grave of my own darling Mary. In the golden silent churchyard where she sleeps beneath the dew, I love her very dearly, so true and sincerely. There is no one in this white world I love more than she. Every bush, every bower, every tree, every flower. On the banks of the lea. There's a house in, in the village of Balnagree which has a very long history behind it. In fact, for years it served as the local national school before the present one was built. And it also served for years at the local post office and it presently is occupied by uh, Mrs. Goggin. So, um, Nancy McCarthy here next to me, her aunt was actually one of the last pupils to go there before the, the um, new school was, was opened. So, Nancy, um, what year would that have been roughly about? Well, she says it was back in 1898, Jerry. She was, sorry. Uh, she must be pretty old at the moment, so is she, she, she still living? She lives in Glenmire. She's close to 90 years. Close to 90. And she's a lot of memories, I suppose, from it still, has she? Well, very little, really, you know. She spent the greater part of her life in America. And one thing she does remember is that she was only going there for, oh, something like two months or something before the new school opened. And would she ever remember who the teacher was at the time, I wonder? Yes, she was a Mrs. Dan Hyde, and she resided above in Turin Farm. It's all known by Patrick Sullivan. Turin, yes. So uh, we might just get a picture of that house later on in the film of the village. So we'll just note it then again. So that's a little bit of history behind it. So uh, thank you very much, Nancy, for coming along and giving us that bit of information. Thank you very much. Well, our next guest for the evening is a man called Neely Coakley. Neely hardly needs an introduction because he's appeared all over the country, we'd say, in plays, in Kyoltus, storytelling, etc. Um, Neely has been in Al-Alvin there on numerous occasions as well and um, I'd just like to ask you Neely uh, when did you become interested in it at all or in, especially in the storytelling when did it all begin for you? Ash it was about uh, the early 70s when I started it I'd say uh, at a concert or something like that So this got you interested in storytelling and you decided to take it up? Yeah that's right uh, you, you won the All-Ireland there in, in Gort in 81 is that right? Uh, that's right and this includes the 32 counties, is it against 26, it's the full? Yeah, it is uh, 32 counties. 32. Um, do you get more enjoyment out of telling stories now, or we'll say you've done a lot of acting in plays as well, which appeals to you more? I wish I wouldn't mind, they're all good pastime. You've been very dedicated over the years, we say, to uh, the stage, and still are. Um, is there any, we'll say, incident from your acting days that might come across to you there, that some funny thing that happened maybe, or wish I know that a lot of little things will happen, but it's hard to recall them now. Um, there's a, a story, I, as far as I know, that you you have for us. That we might, I, I have never heard it before, as far as I can imagine, anyway, I think. But um, 
Yeah, you have a good story there, but I can't think of the lady's name, but um, he, I think it might be a funny story, a sad story. Which uh, it is a kind of a funny story, like... Uh, and what is the lady's name at all? I, I just, uh, oh, yes. Um, I'm, just, I'm probably thinking of a different, on a different line. And anyway, I think, um, before I go any further, anyway, I suppose I'll just ask you to tell a story, anyway, and a story of your own choice. So, big hand for Neely Coakley. Well, uh, the day the first motor car was seen going up Coomas uh, there was a motor bicycle after it. You see, sure, it never rains, but it pours. Uh, a certain party hearing the clitter, they rushed out. Oh, they said, look at that for clipping. And will you look at the foliage running after it? <laughs> well, there was this man, Timmy the Hyatt, and he was never a mile away from a spring well. Papers used to come to that part of the country, and he wasn't acquainted with the headways that were being made in the world. If he was there now, should they be to the moon and back again, and he wouldn't know it. Well, the day the first bicycle was seen around that part of the country, Timmy was at the forge putting slippers on the mare. When the shout went up outside, Gorev on couple earring it tucked, and to come out. Well, the rush that was for the door taking the legs of one another. You swear they were coming out of the chapel. <laughs> well, along came <coughs> the bicycle bouncing. Of course, it was that end. You see, they were very rough and a lot of ramblers. And it went flying past the forge and down the entrain like the Shiriha. And all the heads went down after it till it vanished around the tunnel below. Well, they all came back into the forge again and uh, Timmy was the first man that spoke. Well, so see, could any one of you tell me what is he up in? A bicycle, they said. <laughs> Say that again, so see, so that I'll remember the word. So they said it. A bicycle, so see, wasn't it the idle brain the thought of it? Well, Timmy went home to the wife, and you know, Mag, he said, I saw this thing flying past the forge today, and he wasn't riding it, he wasn't walking, and his two legs were going around. You don't say, says she, and could you give me any inkling as to what it was like? Well, no, he said, the only way I could explain it is that it's if, if he was for all the world as if he was spread legs there on top of the crane, on top of two hoops. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me, says she, what do they call it? Ha ha, says he, didn't I know you'd ask me? And I have the word for you nice and handy. Well, says she, tis what they call it is a... Oh, God dang it, says he, it is in the top of my tongue and I can't bring it out. And he went around the house and he said, bad manners, it isn't that afraid, he said. And I wouldn't mind saying, he said, if it is once, I heard the word but twice. And I wouldn't mind saying, he said, if it was a big word. And you know, he said, for two pins, I'd go down again and I'd ask him, but I know they'd be only laughing at me. Well, you never say anything like the effect it had on the man. Yet it came, he says, she don't be wearing your brain with it, go away out there and to win the cows. Timmy went out, and he spent the rest of the evening talking to himself. You'd see him outside with a pointy litter over his head, sobs falling down all around him, and he trying to think. Well, the cows were milked, and the milk was put into the pans, and the pans were put in the stellum. The cows were stripped, and the stripping strained, and the bulk of it kept for the colouring. The fowl was secured, and the vessels washed, and they all sat down to their supper. And the young lads, they were running around the house and they're playing some little game of their own. And there was the dog and he's sitting in his curry cube in the corner, his tail going around like a windmill, and he yawning. <laughs> put him out, says Timmy, and put him up to bed. How can I think with all this noise? Well, he was put out and they were put up to bed. I can assure you to the saw bicycle to them. No, Mag, says he, I know, would you ever sit there in the corner, he said, and name out all the strange things you ever heard of, so you couldn't anything bring it back to me. Well, Mag rattled off the rivers of China, and the ports of the Mediterranean, and she wound up by saying that she saw written one time in the side of a box, by carbonate of soda. <laughs> stop, stop, says he, you're only addling me. It don't start with a bee. Go on, O'Neill, she said, and we'll say the rosary. 
Well, they went on their knees, but I'm afraid that Timmy's mind wasn't on the subject. Because when it came to his turn, he went over the decket. And when he was gone, two over the quarter, Mag said, glory to him. <laughs> but the hint was only taken as encouragement. <laughs> and finally she had to glory herself for they'd be there until morning. <laughs> well, they went up to bed, and sure, Mag's head was no sooner on the bolster than she was in dreamland. But no, I did Timmy close. He lay there in the dark, his two hands behind his pole, and he gazing into space. And finally he fell into half a doze. And about two o'clock in the morning he rose up in the bed with a terrible roar, giving Mag the elbow. I have it to see, I have it to see. What is it, says she? Sickly by, to see, sickly by. A very of ours is mag, I hope it isn't taking. <laughs> well, here we have a set from Balnagree, and they're going to raise the rafters and, and belt the floor here with the clashing dance set. Put your hands together now for Father Fitzgerald. He's going to sing a song called A Little Peace. Well, I'd like you all to join in the chorus with me. You all know it. Just like a flower when winter begins 
Just like a candle blown out in the wind Just like a bird that can no longer fly I'm feeling that way sometimes But then there's a fallen way down by the lope I picture the light at the end of the road And closing my eyes I can see through the dark The dream that is in my heart A little loving, a little giving To build a dream for the world we live in A little hoping, a little praying For our tomorrow, a little peace A little sunshine, a sea of gladness To wash away all the tears of sadness A little patience and understanding For our tomorrow, a little peace We are feathers on the breeze Sing with me my song of peace I feel like a leaf in the November snow I fell to the ground, there was no one below And now I am helpless, alone with my song Just wishing the storm was gone A little love and a little giving To build a dream for the world we live in A little hoping, a little praying For our tomorrow, a little peace A little sunshine, a sea of gladness To wash away all the tears of sadness A little patience and understanding For our tomorrow, a little peace We are feathers on the breeze Sing with me my song of peace We are feathers on the breeze Sing with me my song of peace This time we have a local singer again, it's uh, Johnny Manny from Rahalisk and he's going to sing a well-known song called The Old Clatter Ring. So put your hands together for Johnny. <laughs> the old clatter ring, it was my grandmother, she wore it a lifetime and gave it to me, and through the long years. She wore it so proudly, T'was made where the clatter rolls down to the sea. What tales it could tell of trials and sorrows, And of grand happy days when the whole world could sing. So we know with sorrow, it will bring love tomorrow. Everyone loves it, the old clattering. As she knelt at her prayers and a thought of her dear ones, her soft, gentle smile, it was charm making. And on her worn hand, as she told me the story, you could see the bright glint of the old clattering. With the crown and the crest to remind me of honor, and clasping the heart that God's blessing would bring. That circle of gold always kept us contented. It was true love entwined 
in, in the old clattering. It was her gift to me, and it made me so happy. With this ring on my finger, my heart it could sing. No king on his throne can be half so happy as I am when I'm wearing the old clattering. When the angels above will call me up to heaven in the heart of the clatter their voices will ring saying away now with sorrow you'll be with us tomorrow be sure and bring with you the old clattering Well, here we've got uh, four people who have actually uh, been involved, we say, uh, among other things, the, chars the charismatic movement. Uh, they've been to Yugoslavia, to Medjugorje, uh, where the apparitions have taken place. And Michael, as well, is involved with the Padre Pio Relic. And um, I'd just like to have a few words with him. And I'll start off here with um, uh, Mary, Mor Mary Manley. Uh, Mary, could you tell me a little bit about the charismatic movement? Well, it's, um, it's, it's prayer life in the spirit, you know, that you grow, read the scriptures and you have a go to a prayer meeting and you grow spiritually, you know, we, we eat food for our physical body to grow, but spiritually we ignore our spiritual nature because we are of twofold being, God dwelling within us. And a lot of the time we don't... Uh, really understand or experience God deep in our lives at all and I'm six years in the charismatic renewal and I have really found a great sense of peace and consolation in the prayer of charismatic renewal for myself and um, are you all involved in the same group in Cork um, Mary, Mary uh, or Kitty Murphy the name is mixed up again. Um, you, you also went to Yugoslavia there uh, during the summer, was it? You were saying it's the first uh, pilgrimage from Ireland to Yugoslavia. Uh, what did you think of the, uh, the setup in Yugoslavia and were you impressed um, by the people? Well, in Yugoslavia, it's a place I'd love to have stayed not to come back at all because it made an awful difference in my life. It really touched me very much the wonderful peace that is there and more especially um, the people of Medjugorje themselves they were, it's a communist country as you all know and the biggest the greatest miracle, miracle that was performed there was the, the um, people of Medjugorje became converted they're all very close to one another and uh, much love for one another more so than what they were, you know. And um, without a doubt, you'd know, you'd know Our Lady was there, you know. Before, even to go into the church, if you never got near the visionary room, you have only just to be on the grounds, and you would know that Our Lady was there. It, take, it makes an awful impression on you. And um, she appeared uh, on the hill on the 24th of June in 1981 to um, six teenagers, when, no, there's one of them, a little boy of, of 11. They were up on the hill looking after sheep, two of the girls, and um, Our Lady appeared to them, but they got such a fright, they didn't think, they didn't take much of it, and they ran, they ran away, and they told their mother that they had seen Our Lady, and uh, the people of Medjugorje and their friends thought that they were they were after taking drugs and that they were um, being carried away about this. So the following evening then they started to cry and said that they wanted to go back up the mountain. So they went back up again and Our Lady appeared to, to them. And um, the little boy um, said to her, the li no, the little boy ran home and uh, 
the mother said then the, for them to take some holy water up with them and to sprinkle it on Our Lady and to say, if it be if it be Satan, be gone Satan. So he shook the holy water and she said, do not be afraid. She said, I am Our Lady, Queen of Peace. So it was then that he um, got very close to Our Lady and he's a, she's appearing to him ever since, except one girl. There's one girl and she has stopped appearing to her. She has got the ten secrets. She only appears to her now on um, her birthdays. Um, it seems, you tell us there, it happened, the first apparition was about three years ago, is that right? Uh, it's unusual, that's only until recently we've heard anything about it in this part of the country, or in Ireland as a whole. Yeah, it's getting very widespread now, I think it, it's uh, the charismatic side really think got this really uh, going, you know. Um, Theresa Moynihan, is it? Uh, Theresa, uh, many people who come back from Lourdes say that there's something about Lourdes that entices them to go back again or some draw back to, to Lourdes that they wish to go back maybe every uh, succeeding year after. Um, is there the same appeal about uh, Medjugorje? Did you find that? Yes, I did. I'd like to go back again because the peace and the love and the joy that I got there, I never forget. And Our Lady's really appearing there and she's come, uh, she comes every night at a quarter of seven, it is quarter of six here. And the prayers she asked for, for seven Our Fathers, seven Hail Marys, seven Glory Be to Fathers, and the I Believe in God. And she asked people to fast on bread and water on a Friday. And if they can't give up, if they can't fast on bread and water to give up cigarettes or television, and she's really coming there, and it is great. It is something that I never forget. Thank you, Teresa. Um, now to Michael Murphy here on my left. Um, Michael, you've been involved with the Padre Pio relic, and I'm sure you do a lot of uh, voluntary work around the city with it, and as everybody knows, the Padre Pio relic is greatly in demand from people who are deeply in trouble through illness or, or um, you know, on the brink of death. Yes, I really cannot keep up with the calls for people who have really dedicated and done have terrible faith in Father Pio, this terrible, wonderful man who suffered torture for over 50 years. Torture, he suffered, he says in his own words, for you and for me. And he also says in his own words that it's the Holy Rosary. Our Lady is above Father Pio, as we know. The Rosary is not to Father Pio, the Holy Rosary is to Our Lady. Now, there is somebody here tonight who have witnessed somebody who was instantly cured through the intercession of Father Pio. You know, let's get us, our facts right. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't leave us, but he left us to carry on his work. When we ask in Jesus' name, he never refuses. Teresa Minahan, far right there, witnessed a person who was instantly cured one night in my presence. And I have witnessed several people who have been cured instantly. Remember, it's not me. It's calling out on Father Pio's name, this man that suffered torture, real torture for us, and that tells us, continuously told us, that the rosary, he was there in our time, he's already dead 15 years. I mean, as late as a month ago, you say, here's somebody from the side of the mountain, that mountain I'm very proud of. Um, the reason that I say that is like any you know, that when you call out in Father Pio's name or in Jesus' name, a month ago I went in to the hospital, the Mercy Hospital, that's the latest now, well there was one later than that, and there was a young boy of 19 years of age dying of rat poisoning. Not, uh, it, this is poison from the rat, if the rat you were in something, it's deadly poison. It's the end of the road. This young boy had um, pneumonia, pleurisy, yellow jaundice, and rat poisoning. His mother, as any mother would be, was in a desperate state. The father was shouting out loud. Now, as you know, in an intensive care unit, you're restricted going in there. Everybody is not allowed in there, but if you have a relic of other POs, I'm there regularly. I went in... What I'm trying to tell you is like the power of Father Pio, the intercession, and the power of the Almighty God. 
The doctor said that this young boy was dying, deteriorating very fast, to send for his sisters fast, that they were on holidays. I prayed over him the best I could, beseech Father Pio and ask in Jesus' name that this young man be cured. The doctor said, he didn't say he came down from 108, 101 or anything, he said his temperature came down like that, this boy will be home in a few days. I'm sorry, I thought one of his parents would be here tonight, they weren't able to come, to tell you. I have seen people cured regularly, but you might ask, which is the best cure? Either the cure of the body or the cure of the soul. I see people regularly in their deathbed. And they're crying out, in the name of Jesus, give me one chance to go back. In the name of the living Jesus, give me one chance to go back. To do what I didn't do. Or to undo some of the wrong of them. And yet, I can tell you for definite, there wasn't ever any tablet or injection ever invented that could comfort a person in their dying bed the same as the word of God I witness four cures one day there are several people who have been cured of cancer any of the four group will tell the three group with me and cured of depression each and every one of us tonight and today we all need each other we're not doing what we did when we were young there was 14 and 10 of us there my father died, I can quite clearly remember, when my father died, March, the very wind cried howl for me. I was only six years of age, there was younger, four younger than me. I heard my mother saying, who was in a desperate way at the time, we'll win through, she said, by the Holy Rosary. Thanks be to Jesus, we did win through the Holy Rosary. But, how many are saying the Rosary today? Father Pio has said in his own words, he's only dead 15 years, he said in his own words that if we say the rosary, he'll see us in heaven. I mean, for the people that I see crying out, in the name of Jesus, give me one chance to go back. We have a chance now, we should take it. We should say that rosary. I have a pilgrimage statue of Our Lady. I would love to bring it, I call home to Belnagri all the time, like this is home to me, where I was born and reared. Our Lady of Fatima, and um, I would love to give this statue to the people of Ballinagri to bring back a little bit of happiness and comfort to their homes. Forget about the hot jars and television and the rest of it that are rotting our minds away. We'll only get one chance. Those people here have witnessed wonderful things through people because. Even if a person is down and out, and I defy contradiction to anybody, I don't care, I could give you a doctor's number tonight to ring. More than one doctor. Even if a person is down and out, the secret is, if you can come to somebody, if you can really tell your worries or troubles, no matter what they are, your worries or troubles, this is God's truth, there's people coming regularly to our house, my own wife don't know what they're speaking to me about. It wouldn't be fair. The same as if the priest in confession told people's sins it wouldn't be fair it's not right it's not on because the first thing when you look at this person is the first thing that's going to strike your mind so we have one chance and when i'm speaking for this man that suffered torture for me and for each and every one of us i'm a bit ashamed who laughs at me because one evening i was in the south infirmary there was this man in the intensive care unit and he was on the way out as the doctor said. He was dying. There was no chance for him. I was asked by Dennis Linehan, uh, a tr um, representative of uh, a rep for Murphy's Brewery, to see whether I go into the intensive care unit. I said, I will, if his wife approves of it. And he said to the wife, oh God, she said, I'd love if you did. I went in. When I was praying over this man, there was a way in another world. There was two young nurses and a young doctor. One of the young nurses laughed out loud. I didn't take any notice. I guess a little bit of sense of humor too. I didn't take any notice. But he woke up instantly. He was home in four days. And remember, I have seen people of all walks of life cured. 
through the intercession of Father Pio. The power of the rosary is beyond belief. I know it. I have witnessed it. I was years in London. And I said, thanks be to Jesus tonight. I met several people who were away from God. There's people here in this room that knows this night. Away from God. Satan is a mighty trickster too, you know. And through the power of the rosary, I led people back to the men that for can forgive sin. That's not me, that's the priest. So we should help and all hold hands and help our priest because we don't listen to him when he's giving that Sunday sermon and when he's speaking. It goes in one ear and out the other. There's no goodness crying like at the end of the day. Lord Jesus, give me one chance to go back. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. And um, very special thanks to, to Mary Manley, Tracy Minan and Kitty Murphy also for coming along here at very short notice. And we hope to see you again. And, uh, and keep up the good work. And on a light note, I think I'll ask the song here from Tracy Minan, who is very good on the vocal cords as well. Come on, Tracy. Walk through this world with me. Go where I go, share all my dreams with me, I need you so, in life we search, and some of us find, I've looked for you, my love. A long, long time And now that i found you Blue horizon I see Come take my hand And walk to this world with me Walk through this world with me. Go where I go. Share all my dreams with me. I need you so. In life we search. And some of us find. I've looked for you, my love, a long, long time. And now that i found you, blue horizon I see. Come take my hand and walk. To this world with me. Thank you, Teresa. A song that sums the whole thing up, I think. Thank you very much. Well, I'm afraid all good things must come to an end. And um, this night, as this night is drawn to a close, I wish to thank Lena May Donovan here alongside me for allowing us to the premises for tonight. Uh, thanks, Lena. And uh, Lena might just say a small word there. Are you glad to see the crowd or are you delighted with them? It, it, it was a great crowd. There is no doubt about it. It was a great crowd. And I thank everybody for coming. And I thank his name is Dan Joe Kaler for doing such a wonderful job. And for all the singers, dancers and neighbours and yourself and Gloria that, yeah. Thanks a little, Lena. Yeah. And uh, one thing I'd like to say there, just a round of applause, please. One thing I'd like to say is that, uh, no doubt, we missed out on somebody tonight. There's a, there's a lot of talent in... There's a, there's a lot of talent in Balnagree as a whole, and I suppose if we were to stay till morning, we probably wouldn't get through the full full crowd. Uh, no doubt, there'll be another programme done from Balnagree in the not-too-distant future, and we hope to get everybody who was missed out on tonight along the next night. So, now we have the Balnagree dancers to do a barn dance for you, backed by Hina Kyoto. So, good night, and God bless.
Thank <laughs> you.